Hello and welcome to The Daily Reprieve, where we provide essay speaker meetings, workshops, and conferences in podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast. If you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by going to donate.thedailyreprieve.com and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Please consider donating monthly by clicking the Donate Monthly button. However, one-time donations are always welcome. Just click the Donate Now button. Now, without further ado, this episode of The Daily Reprieve. Hi, my name is Roy. I'm a sexaholic. It's an unusual privilege to be with you today, especially this weekend and what's been happening. And uh, I can't help but feel it very deeply. And... uh, I'm just so grateful to be sharing it with you. Uh, My dear wife, Iris, is with me, and I just would love to have her stand. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my life. And he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. Uh, I had a couple of things in mind that I might have uh, spoken about this morning. And uh, things have happened, a couple of things have happened that have just hit me, and I have to bring them up, and we'll just see where we go from there. Uh, The first was the fact of Lloyd's suicide. And those of you who do not know, uh, he was a leader in SA, and I understand he uh, went back out there. And I know nothing of the details And I did not know Lloyd personally, although I had seen him in meetings. And uh, it's strange how these things happen uh, on the timing of some of these things. This, uh, uh, I believe, once in a while we have these things hit us, and it makes it brings the seriousness of our program to our to our attention. Uh, The other happening that was unexpected uh, was the workshop on lust recovery. How many were in that, uh, in those two workshops? Okay. Um, In Cranford, New Jersey, November 6th, 1999, was when we first started discussing the Akron experience, which launched the whole 12-step movement. Uh, This was the first time I ever spoke about it, and through a series of circumstances that I had nothing to do with, this was brought to my attention. So uh, it's one of these things that I'm very slow sometimes, in catching on, and I uh, was glad to see this. So for the first time in my 24 years of sobriety, whatever it is, or since even back to April 24th, 1974, Armenian Martyrs' Day, was the first time I was able to grasp a little bit of what happened in Akron, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, 1935, 36, 37, 38, which was, I believe, <clears throat> the most important and potentially far-reaching event of the 20th century, perhaps of the 19th and 20th century. And we're just at the beginning. We're at the beginning, I believe, of what that initiated. 
And what it initiated was in a context for sinners, a way out, a context for, see, these guys that were the drunks in 1935 <clears throat> called themselves sinners after a while. And because, once they got sober, because they had to recover from a lot more than alcoholism. And I'd like to tell you about that a little bit. And tell you about my personal discovery and hope that I have in trying to translate that experience into lust recovery. Now, what we saw yesterday, and what we saw in Cranford, New Jersey, 1999, was something that we would not have anticipated. And that is that after 20 years of Sexaholics Anonymous, we found a hunger and a thirst for lust recovery coming to the surface. So maybe it's taken us 20 years to discover the real problem. And the real problem, in my estimation, is not sex addiction. The real problem is not those related things. Our real problem is something that is spiritual for us. And so apparently, this movement that God brought forth in 1935 to cut through the impossible solution for people who were hopeless, that that is progressing. And in our disease, <clears throat> we come up with the fact that we have a spiritual illness. Of course, the Alkis knew that themselves, but now with lust, it's deeper, isn't it? And so we have to ask ourselves, what is lust recovery? Our Tradition 3 says the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop lusting and to become sexually sober. And when we look back and say how, how that could have gotten into our literature and how this emphasis was put on lust, whereas today, for the first time, perhaps, as a fellowship, we're beginning to see the real sickness is an amazing thing that nobody can take credit for. And that I believe we need to be obedient to. All you and I have to do is look at what's happening. And, look, and that begins by looking at ourselves. That's why I believe the most important thing we can do today in our, in our meetings, in our inner groups, and in our top leadership is a recovery inventory of one another, which really for most of us means a lust inventory. <laughs> And the most powerful meetings, some of the most powerful meetings I've ever been to, are those occasional meetings, sometimes not even planned, where in lieu of the meeting, we will go around the circle, be beginning with the leader, and state where we are, regardless of the length of our sexual sobriety. We don't hide behind that at all. Each of us is naked, absolutely honest, and goes around telling where we are with lust today. Non-recovery, recovery, whatever. And that's the basic honesty that brought this movement into being in 1935. You see, what we don't realize sometimes is that when Bill and Bob got together at Henrietta Sieberling, and then at Ann's breakfast table, Dr. Bob's wife, morning after morning, staying sober, and then working, beginning the miracle of working with others. That didn't come out of a vacuum. That didn't fall down out of heaven. There was a groundwork laid for decades that made that possible. And one of the elements of that groundwork was the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group no longer exists. Uh, it was a non apparently, I don't know much about it, apparently a non-denominational a kind of religious gathering of people who discovered, well, they had a founder, but they, one of the bases of their fellowship was the four absolutes. They called them absolutes. Absolute honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. And they used these principles to help 
them guide their lives. And so there was a moral, spiritual environment in which Bill and Bob and Ann discovered this working of God by helping others. And so when they, so this was paramount. So the first of these is absolute honesty. And so the, for us to discover, test God, whether or not the miracle of 1935 can work for me and for you, the first requirement is absolute honesty. Where we are today where we are today. And every time I've done that in a meeting, not every, quite every time, there are times when the leader isn't absolutely honest. We go around and we're, not as on, and we're just as dishonest as that leader was. I mean, it's strange how we are. We, we are a very susceptible, other-directed kind of people, which makes us very vulnerable. It's a very difficult part of our syndrome. But when we do, when the leader breaks through. I'll never forget one. He had years of sobriety, and he broke through, and he said, when I, got up, when I got up in the morning, the first thing that happens to me is a sexual fantasy. And then we went around that circle, and this was a leader, uh, and, and we went around that circle, and everyone just broke through. And it made us one. It made us one. Why did it make us one? How can honesty of our spiritual sickness, how can honesty about <laughs> the impossibility of what we are inside, how can that make us one? I hope I brought with me the... Uh, I see that I didn't. Does anybody have the uh, uh, Am Frank Amos report with them? Okay, thank you. You're going to bring it up here. Uh, I may refer to that. This was... Uh, I'll just give you the history behind that. It's just a one-pager. In 1937 or 38, Bill W., who was the organizational wizard of Alcoholics Anonymous, decided that this thing was so great, it was working so well, it was out of hand. They needed money. So he goes to no less than Rockefeller, the richest man in the world. <laughs> Uh, no one has the uh, sheet just from the... Uh, yeah, could you give me that, Craig? And uh, they asked for money. And Sir Rockefeller said, no, thank God, but you know what he did? He sent Frank Amos, who was, I believe, an advertising executive, not alcoholic. Thank you very much. Okay, that's Craig from North Dakota? Okay, Fargo. Fargo. And he went up there all alone. He needs the support, too. <laughs> you got a lot of friends, Craig. You guys go shake his hand after the meeting. <laughs> Anyhow, Frank Amos, this, uh, this wise money man and investigator for the richest man in the world, comes in, and he's, his job is to investigate. And he goes around interviewing no less than Dr. Bob's fellow surgeons and nurses and the board of directors in the Hosp Akron City Hospital. And he goes to meetings. He talks to all these people, and he's there. They let him in meetings. And he gets to know what's happening, and he writes this report. It's published in uh, 1938, February, I think. Anyhow, that's the first objective description of the program. There was no program. <laughs> there was nothing in writing. There were no steps, there was no book, and there was nothing. But there was something happening. And this guy, this is the report, and it's on page 131 of Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. And, and for those of you, I'm so glad that somebody had the foresight to put that on the literature table. I hope they're all gone because this is the book. You see, this book, the big book, is the conceptualization, an attempt at conceptualizing what was happening in Akron. At the time, Frank Amos gives us this little insight. And conceptualizations are also are always after the fact. They're one degree of abstraction removed from the reality. But in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, you got the reality. You know why? Because that book is based on actual interviews, tapes, letters, and whatnot of the people that were there 
at T. Clarice Williams's house where the drunks would meet once they got sober a couple of times a week. And um, just to give you, you've heard me say this before. It's on the tape, by the way. Glenn has the, the, ta- the Cranford tape, I understand. So through some weird circumstance, he was given a, a tape of that thing, and, and it's available. Uh, Just, just a brief glimpse, first of all, before we get to the Frank Amos report. What's happening the very first time is two drunks get there, and then Dr. Bob says, we've got to find another. And so the director of the hospital says, yeah, we got a live one on, on the third floor or something. So, <laughs> so they, they go there, and they get number three failed. He doesn't make it, but number four does. And so they, got, they get a few like this, and the prospects come into the hospital. And every day, two or more quote, recovered alcoholics talk to that man in, his, in bed. He's going through medication for alcohol withdrawal. These are last gaspers. The guys are in bad shape. You know, they're in bad shape. And here are these two guys who are in pretty good shape talking to them about what they have to do to get sober. And at the end of that five- or six-day period, a strange thing happens. They press a demand on that person. They have never pressed any demand, but they say, if you want to recover, you'll have to give up your right to drink to God. And they would do it right there, kneel by the bed. And if the guy didn't make it there, they'd have to kneel in the upstairs bedroom before they could go to the meeting, because no drunks went to the meeting. They were all sober. Okay, so uh, there's this picture of vitality. And it's most, you know, this is the Depression. Nobody has money. Uh, A nickel phone call or whatever, you know, it's it's a lot of money. And they're, they're together, but they have a nucleus of what I'm beginning to call, and you can help me with the terms, because I'm experiencing this today in the last year, for the first time in Sexaholics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, they're beginning to have an intimate spiritual fellowship. There aren't any, there isn't any organization, there are no groups or anything else. These are men and women, eventually, who are daily meeting and working and the outreach is going. The amazing thing of the miracle was that the impulse had to go outward. These people, once they had this awakening, these people who surrendered to God in the presence of others, gave up their right. The impulse was a spiritual awakening. And that's why we have our 12th step. The 12th step is having, uh, you know, as a result of these steps, the spiritual awakening. Okay, um, so it's difficult for us to imagine, even from Dr. Bob and the good old timers, what was happening. The only way you can, the only way you can figure out what was really happening is to experience it. And you know what? That's what I'm offering today in this broken way of trying to get it through. I'm saying we truly are at a new beginning. Now, this is not for everybody. You know, this apparently will still continue to be just another self-help group. And that's all some people want. But listen, there's something happening here for people who want it, and that's a new beginning. And I believe it's a new awakening, just, just like what we had. That's the promise. So I'm going to read, uh, just briefly get into this. This is the report on page 131 of Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. Now listen to how this guy describes what's happening. Now, he's not describing this inner spiritual life from the inside because he's not experienced this from the inside like I am. Sometimes people wonder at at the intensity. Somebody said, I forget who it was after the meeting, boy, you sure were passionate in that. And I don't know what he was referring to, which which meeting. And, uh, you know, there is. There's something. There's a fire burning in my bones, in my soul. And if I don't speak, if I don't express it, I'm a liar. 
That's all. And if I don't express it and speak it, I'm damming up something in myself and I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not getting any farther. Okay, number one. I'm only going to read, say, the first five of these things on this page because those, in those first five points that Frank Amos makes, the word must appears seven times. <laughs> an alcoholic must realize that he is an alcoholic, incurable from a medical standpoint, and that he must never again drink. I can see that that hits heavy on lustaholics right here. Man, that's hit us right between the eyes, didn't it? Because we know what we're talking about, drinking. I could drink in my dreams. And nobody would know. I could drink in a meeting just like this. And nobody would know. And I could drink out there in the ritual. And only I would know. But I was drunk. I was drunk. Do you know how many we, drunks we have in SA that are leading meetings? Just as, an off, just as an offhand thing, I might as well unburden this to you, <laughs> as I did in the workshop. Part of the syndrome of our lustaholic, sexaholic personality seems to be that we are so tolerant and loving and democratic and gentle and people-pleasing that we will just let anybody take any position of authority in any meeting and at any level of Sexaholics Anonymous. Am I just, anybody with me here? <laughs> what does our 12th tradition say? We put principle before personality. What is the basic underlying principle of Sexaholics Anonymous? Recovery. Sobriety, recovery, isn't that, the, isn't that the one and only principle, the basic principle? So everything has to serve recovery. And the service structures, I told to the delegates, must serve recovery. Okay. He must never drink. How many of us, and, and let's just try the honesty here, because we have Essanons here too, you just have to put up with me. I can't... <laughs> I can't speak. I can't speak for you, dear people. But you know what? Where's the lady that just spoke? Uh, this is just another aside. I can't believe what I just heard, and I've got to pass this on to you. She's talking about someone in the sex workers industry. Do you know how many pornographic videos come out of the San Fernando Valley each month? New titles, new titles. I've forgotten the number. That's just in one locality. That's where I live, near where I live. Do you know how many sex workers and prostitutes we have in our culture? It's increasing, and the age keeps getting younger and younger. Now, I was talking with a woman, an ex-prostitute, who came to SA, and I was so glad to see her come because I'm a prostitute junkie hooked on prostitutes hopelessly. And at the end, I was falling in love with about every other prostitute. My lover was, was just out of control. And at the very end, at the end of my last three months sex drunk, that prostitute, who was the embodiment of every lust fantasy picture, fantasy dream, or whatever I'd ever seen or thought of, was there in the motel room. And that's when I made the decision to, I have to be a pimp to keep her, and I made that decision, leave my, my dear wife, leave my career, leave my job, and give up God. I made that decision. And then the moment of clarity came. Within three days, I'd be looking for another. So that was the pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization that I had to experience. Now, getting back to the, the prostitute, she comes into USA in West Los Angeles, and uh, we talk with her. She starts bringing in other prostitutes that want to stop. And they don't come back. They keep trying, but they can't come back. Now, why do you think they feel like they can't come to that meeting? 
they feel too uncomfortable. Now, that's part of their problem. That's part of their problem. I feel uncomfortable, too, when a newcomer hooker comes into a meeting or a newcomer attractive woman comes in. That's my, that's my problem. I have to lean into that fear. They have to, too, but there's something there. There's something there. I've heard of, I heard of some in our meetings that won't let women into a meeting. Anyhow, I bring this up because the, one of the burdens of my heart are, is for the prostitutes and sex workers of America, especially the Los Angeles area. That's a prayer of my heart that God will open a door. And you know what? I believe these women belong in SA. Where else can they go? What else is there? Because they're really, they have the same problem we do, the desire to be lusted after, captive to the lust of men. Can't live without it, most of them. Once in a while, you're going to find the happy hooker who's just making a living. But hey, you got to show her to me first. I don't believe that in the film. I just don't believe that. I've met too many of them. Iris and I have had more than one in our home, and we know what's going on. Have you ever seen their illegitimate children in a retarded place, strapped to cribs? I have. They belong here. Are we ready? Why aren't we ready? Because we don't have any re lust recovery. They've got to feel our lust recovery. Sure, we can feel bothered. I do too. But we can look them back and we can give and because God is there. Because 1935, the miracle of Akron, of a spiritual awakening is there. Okay, Frank Amos, item two. He must surrender himself absolutely to God, realizing that himself there is no hope. Man, you know how they got that word absolute in this, these program people? I didn't design this program. I mean, you know... He must surrender himself absolutely to God, realizing in himself there is no hope. How many of us are really, when it comes down to it, still trying so valiantly to stop, to decrease the boundaries, to control, to not, to not, to confess, come back, feel better, go through the guilt, go through the confession. You know, meetings are confessional, right? Okay. <laughs> We feel a pseudo-absolution. There's no absolution without a recovery fellowship. There's no grace of God. You know, where there's absolution, there's freedom. When God forgives, it's because we've sent it away. It's behind his back. Anyhow, absolutely. So we've got... Listen to that. I mean, these guys... Man, where, where do we hear that? Now, number three, not only must he want to stop drinking permanently, <laughs> you know, I just thank God I finally came to the place. I don't want to, I don't want to have to look anymore. I don't want to want to look anymore. I'm willing to give it up. You take it. That's the greatest freedom in the world. It doesn't mean I'm not tempted. Of course I'm tempted. But I'm free. I'm free. And while I'm at it, I might as well give you my testimony. <laughs> uh, that's why I brought the big book. I kind of thought I'd be using it. you got to hear this. You've just simply got to hear this. Excuse me, this is too hot. <laughs> okay, this is step 10. This is step 10, and it's telling us the promise of the Akron 1935 program. Now, the only word I'm going to change when I read is alcohol to lust. Trust me. You've all got this book. <laughs> okay. And, and I guess instead of we, I'm going to say I. I'll try. And my wife is back there, so help me. Plus my accountability group, that core, intimate, spiritual fellowship of a few people that I am accountable to. Some of those are here. Don't raise your hands, please. <laughs> And 
I'm still a liar at heart, but I'm just going to try to, you know, I, I, I just, this, I've got to tell you what it's like today. If I can't tell you what it's like, how, you know, how can, I help, how can I help anybody? Okay, I have ceased fighting. Well, let's say we, because that's what it is here. We have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even lust. I've stopped fighting lust, folks. And I used to fight it with everything I had. Until at the very end, the only fight left was a 38 caliber slug. I've ceased fighting lust. Thank God there's a better way. You don't have to fight it. Next sentence. For by this time, sanity will have returned. That may, is a maybe. Iris would have to... <laughs> But I'm okay on the next sentence. We will seldom be interested in lust. I'm not interested in lust anymore, most of the time. And isn't that marvelous? When I got sober, my head could not stop turning. I had whiplash at Royal High School for the girls and the teachers. I just, I mean, and I didn't know what was happening. Because I stopped the sex. We were in abstinence. I was kicked out anyway. And the lust surfaced. I didn't know I had lust. You never, you, you don't really know what your disease is until you're going to abstinence. You married guys, you hear that? <laughs> How many singles are here? Single, a, a sing, sex, look at that, look at that. Half of our people in SA are single. Okay, so don't worry about abstinence. <laughs> no, and reason, I, I just believe this with all my heart from my own experience. You cannot discover the spiritual underpinning of your disease until you stop the, the acting out, the overt symptoms, and let what's in there driving it surface. That's why I'm going to take a real risk here. Be careful. You know, everybody and his brother who comes in and feels this surfacing immediately goes to a psychiatrist and gets a prescription for pills. And, and, you're, and we're free to do that. And we have no judgment on that. I'm just saying, recognize. Be careful. Have a check meeting, you know. Know what you're doing. Okay. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. I thank God. You know, when I'm confronted with lust, there's an element of fear that strikes. A real lust, a real lust, a real lust. And it's okay to be afraid. I want to get beyond that so that most of the time... I can give instead of being afraid. That's my last absolute surrender, was to be able to look at that face. Like an, you know, and they look like angels from heaven. And even if it's a prostitute or whatever it is, to look at that face and give immediately, instead of recoiling in fear or turning, you know, to be able to give. And whenever I've done that, it's the most powerful thing in the world. There's an interchange of life. And that person is, is shaken up. They don't even know it. And you pass, but you feel marvelously free. But if tempted, we recoil it from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. And we will find that this has happened automatically. Man. But you know, it took work. What's the work? What's the one word it takes? Surrender. Now we're getting it. Surrender. Stages of surrender. Stages of surrender. Progressive victory over lust. I don't think any of us, let me just speak for myself, I could not see this next stage of my bondage and lust unless I had made progressive surrenders. Absolutely. Giving up that right. Okay. We will see that our new attitude toward lust has been given us without any thought or effort on our part, it just comes if we do the work, if we do the surrender, if we do the surrender, if we do the steps. You know, this is all step 10. See, if we're at step 10, nobody can get anywhere, I don't think, in surrender. Nobody is fully surrendered unless their ninth step is complete. Now, that's what Chuck C. told me personally. That's not from me, that's from Chuck C. We're not surrendered 
unless we fully, unless we've done the ninth step. Okay. Um, that's the miracle of it. We're not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. Look at this promise, you see. This is something we can, this is the promise for you and me. We don't have to fight it. We don't have to avoid it. As a matter of fact, does it work? The more, the more I used to fight it, it invested it with energy because the lust in itself is in me. The more energy I give it, the more energy I have. So what I do today, I immediately say, Lord, you know what I want to do right now. You come in and you just take it. See, that's not fighting it. That's accepting it. Accepting it. That's what I want. And I give that. That's the surrender because that, that's the moment, my, that, that's the temptation, my temptation surrender that comes once we've done an absolute surrender in our accountability circle. Okay. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Can you believe that, some of you? It's the promise. We can have the shield of that presence and protection. We have not even sworn off. I haven't sworn off. I never have sworn off. Either acting out or lusting. I've never signed a pledge. I've never said I'm not going to do this again. That's what I did before the program. I'm never going to do this again. Tear up the magazines. Tear up the phone. Burn the phone numbers. Whatever. Burn the films. No. Instead, the problem has been removed. Now, what I, I have to add, that's one word I'm going to change here. Instead, the drinking problem has been removed. I still have a problem. I'm a lustaholic. But my drinking problem has been removed. The obsession. And I'm not going to read the rest of this, but this will, pages 84 and 85. And this, again, I just, is the promise of our program. And it's summarized in those few words in one sentence in the 12, forward to the 12 and 12. When you get home, look it up. The very first page of the forward of the 12 and 12, the third paragraph, goes like this. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. Now, when I heard the first speaker in this conference quote that passage, it just knocked me off my chair because for the last year, this is the passage that has been hitting me. Now, this is the promise of the 12 steps. This is the legacy of 1935. We can ride the elevator all the way down, or we can get off at the lobby level. And I think we're at the lobby level. There's something new happening, and this is what I want to talk about. And it has to be very personal because I can preach. Uh, I can preach page 131 of Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and Miracle of 35 till I'm blue in the face, and it doesn't mean anything if it's not for me, if I can't have it. It used to be the way SA got started. How did SA get started? <clears throat> Few people read an article and they try to start meetings. I tried to start a meeting. You tried to start a meeting. And just hope somebody comes. And when they come, you say, just keep coming back. That's not the way our program started. That's doing it from the outside in. That's doing it from the outside in. I believe that does not work for us. It hasn't worked for us for 20 years. We keep starting meetings. And people come by the thousands. And they leave by the thousands. <laughs> And members come and go, newcomers come and go, and the sobriety up and down 
And lust recovery, we, we, didn't, we don't even talk about it. It's that last refuge of the sexaholic. So, um, Roy K. doesn't exist anymore. He's gone. And in his place is Roy Culgin. And he's part of a very tenuous, small few who want what he wants. The same hunger of, what, what was that, 40 or 50 men yesterday that wanted hunger, wanted surrender of their lust to God in an accountability fellowship. And what we belong to, sometimes we're in the same group, sometimes we aren't. But we gravitate. It just seems like eventually when our hunger of two people, our hunger for God, deeper recovery, deeper sobriety, deeper fellowship gets to that point where we've got to find it. See, in 1980, in, in the late 70s, I said, if I can't find my people, I'm gonna, the stones are going to cry out. And I was able to find my sex drunks. Today, the cry of my heart is, I want to find my people today who want a deeper fellowship, a deeper recovery, and a, and a deeper experience with God. And it's beginning to happen just tenuously. And it's so nobody, you know, they're, they're not... And that's what happened yesterday here. And that's what happened in Cranford, New Jersey. And it's just the beginning. And that's why the challenge... Let me just put it in practical terms. When we, when two of us find each other and we help each other in a deeper recovery, and when this starts happening, you know what we do, what seems to happen? We pray for a third. That's what we did. And we got a third. We got three. And then when that's happening and that person surrenders, we wind up praying for another, and another comes in from the inside out. And it's all based on going to that meeting. Sure, we go to the meetings. No, it's based on the surrender to God and discovering the solution. Discovering the solution that when, I'm, when, I've temp- when I've given up my right to lust in that next temptation... I can surrender it. In the beginning, we may have to call. But anyhow, don't sell yourself short. And what happens is when we, when we have this core, intimate, spiritual fellowship together and are experiencing the fruit of surrender and the joy of God's little, little tiny little presence in our midst, then we're in the groups that we go to, and man, suddenly we're going to speak up and ask for a business meeting. And let's do something here. And that's what we're doing. And so people ask me what groups I go to today. And I say, well, groups I can do the most damage in. (laughs) So you get the picture. Uh, And those of you who were in those groups yesterday... Uh, you know, we didn't know how to handle the number of people that wanted to do a surrender, but the surrenders that I was witness to and that others were witness to, at least I can speak for the ones I was in, were very real experiences that showed the promise of what I want in my fellowship. And there's a price to be paid, and that is you've got to put God first in your life, and you've got to put this working of His presence together first in your daily life. And you know what? If the awakening is there, it's going to be first. Sorry. (laughs) It's from the inside out always. That's why the 12th step, having had the awakening as the result. And so I just in my, uh, I'm exhausted (laughs) today. And, uh, just want to leave you with this tremendous hope. For the first time in 20 years, I just sit back and I just know that there's something happening that's larger than SA. And that I want to be part of. And all I have to do is be obedient to that light in my little fellowship. And it ain't easy. 
You know, I had pneumonia in the first part of November. <clears throat> Never had it before in my life. I go into the hospital, and uh, everything went wrong. I remember seeing a movie years ago called Hospital, where this crazy doctor is murdering people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the author, uh, forget his name, the author of the, of the film script is trying to tell us how bad, how bad it is to be in a hospital. And that, that came down on me, because when, when, I, when I asked the nurse, I, you know, here's a doctor who puts me in there, after the wrong diagnosis, and um, he writes out a whole page, eight and a half by eleven, the doctor's orders for the nurses, you know. And so I asked, "Well, let me see that. I, I, I want to know what he's ordered for me." They wanted me to get in bed, and I said, "I'm not going to undress and get in bed until I read, until I know what what they're going to do to me." Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know English. But she brings it in and tries to read it, and she can't read it. And so, you know what happened to me? A little window of fear opened in my heart. <laughs> and the fear let in the, let in the what? The, the potential rage or resentment or something. And, and I opened that window of fear, and by the time, within a couple of days, when other things started coming down on me just like that, I had opened the door of fear, and I was drunk on fear. I was drunk on fear. And so I called two members from my little spiritual, that I, my accountability partners, and I put on a bathroom and walked over to a little tiny chapel, and we had a check meeting for this character. Check meeting. And I submitted myself to that questioning, to that prayer, to that, discernment to that, you know, what's going on. And you know what happened? Underneath that fear, I had work to do with Iris. I'd been starting to take her for granted. That was one of the big gifts that thing gave me. The other thing was, underneath all of that was my unbelief for SA. I have to confess this. I've been a glass half empty guy most of the time because I see, you know, I, I've been struggling with this stuff. And, 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 but you know what? Today, I'm suddenly glass half full. That's what I want to leave with you. There is a new beginning. And you and I can't stop it and we can't make it happen. There is a new beginning. And the beginning is nothing new. Because it happened in 1935. It's the simple way, the surrender. And instead of a man, you know, we do this with our sponsors, we come in as newcomers, but eventually, the ones of you that I'm just longing to, to, to take in my arms and wish I, could, wish I could hold you in that next temptation where you have to get drunk on it. This promise is to us and to our children. And so I'm going to close <laughs> with something that I don't want to read, but I have to because it was given to me this morning. And uh, what's behind all of this? What's behind all of our lust, misconnection, is our unfulfilled hunger for the source of our lives. And that's what he's promising to us through the surrender, the finding him, finding in that surrender. When we come up to that death that we have to make, if you were in these surrenders yesterday, you'd see there was always a point where it's impossible See, when we question people so deeply, instead of a glib, yeah, I could do my will and life to God, when we forget that and just come to the focus point or that top plate of what's in the way, what that person has to give up in order to find God and get and recover, get victory. When you get to that place, that, that's, so, that's so powerful. 
and uh, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades and the breath of the Lord blows on it and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever and get you up to a high mountain. Herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. And say to the cities, Behold your God, the God of the sexaholic. The God of the lustaholic is our God. God is for the lustaholic. God is for the lustaholic. He's the only one who can take my lust, my resentment, my fear when I surrender it. This is my prayer and my great joyous hope for us all today. Thank you. I would like to thank you for listening to this episode of The Daily Reprieve, the best source for experience, strength, and hope for SA members. Please subscribe to this podcast to be alerted of new episodes. Please show your support by donating to The Daily Reprieve by going to donate.thedailyreprieve.com and choosing either monthly donations or a one-time donation by clicking Donate Now. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode of The Daily Reprieve.